The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. One of the greatest, I should say, is Les Klinger. Thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. So, so Les, now, um, for yourself, how did this start? Um, the well... Whole- yeah, I mean, I I know the story. I actually do know the story. I've I've actually thought about it. So, um, it, it for me, it started when I was in law school. I, 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 there we go right away. I should have said that. I'm a, by day, I'm a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> uh, when I was in law school back in the dark ages, um, I got a gift from my girlfriend of a book called The Annotated Sherlock Holmes by William Baring Gould. A wonderful, large, two-volume set. And I was a very good student, but I uh, had a rigid policy that I needed to do recreational reading from 11 p.m. to midnight in order to stay sane during law school. So I started to read that book, and I was hooked. I was hooked in part by the Sherlock Holmes stories, which I have to admit I had not paid any attention to as a kid. I was a science fiction reader. Um, but I was also hooked by the footnotes and the discovery that there was this cult of amateur scholars who had devoted themselves for 70 years to writing about Sherlock Holmes and the Victorian period. And I thought to myself, that was really cool. I wanted to sort of be part of the game, and I started to collect Sherlock Holmes stuff, and I started to read uh, the source, the Baker Street Journal, and of course I read all Baron Gould, and I had this little fantasy that someday, maybe when I was really old and retired, I might get to be the person who would update that book. It had come out in 1968, and you know, someday, 50 years down the road, whatever, it was going to need updating. So that's where it stood for a long time. And for the next 30 years, I built a legal career and raised a family and was a, you know, was a collector, but I didn't do any writing. And then one day in the mid-'90s, I said to my wife, for one too many times, I think, so what are we doing this weekend? And uh, she said, you know, you have all those books on Sherlock Holmes. Why don't you write something? And I thought about it, and I thought, you know, well, I've written legal articles and things like that. Why not? So I started to write articles, and then I said, you know, maybe I could start this idea of re-annotating the the original Sherlock Holmes stories. And so I started playing around with that. And one thing led to another. I I, uh, I started producing a, a series called the Sherlock Holmes Reference Library that was a whole new annotated version of the stories. And then in 2002, out of the blue, I got a call from a senior editor at W.W. Uh, w. Norton, major publisher out of New York, who said, you know that old Bering Gould book? We want to put out a new edition, and we hear you're the guy to edit it. And it was like, me? You know, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I, I'm not, uh, you know, I, <laughs> this is a little hobby of mine. But uh, they said, no, we, we hear you've already started doing it. So I got to it, put it out, and uh, I was very fortunate. Those books uh, were nominated for a bunch of awards, and I won the Edgar, and I thought to myself, well, obviously I'm God's gift to writers. You know, I should be, why have I been uh, hiding myself under a bushel for all these years? I should be writing. So I thought about what the next project would be. The next project that came to mind that was sensible was Dracula. Uh, I produced an annotated edition of Dracula, and that was really the beginning of my saying, you know, maybe I could be a real writer. And uh, so with the help of friends, we um, started to put together anthologies of uh, different sorts and uh, have done a lot of annotating since then. I'm now up to something like uh, 30 books or 35 books, something like that. So That's amazing. A lot of work. I, maybe explain to the uh, listeners that, don't know uh, what what kind of work and detail goes into annotating well i 
I usually say what you do is you take a classic text and you sprinkle a bunch of footnotes over it, and you know then you have an annotated edition. Uh, what I'm trying to achieve is kind of like the director's track on a DVD. It's a bonus. It, it's not essential. These books that I've annotated, <laughs> um, whether it's uh, Sherlock Holmes or Dracula or Frankenstein or H.P. Lovecraft or other things, they don't need Klinger to make them uh, popular or uh, uh, successful. These are classics. Uh, they've already got big audiences. So my aim is to make the reading experience more enjoyable, to maybe add dimensions to the reading that the reader didn't know were there. Um, and and so the footnotes and the and the introductory essays and the supplementary essays aim to show them different kinds of things about the story, the cultural context, the historical context, um, glossary. There's a certain amount of glossary when you're talking about books that are old. Um, problems. Why did the characters behave this way and do this instead of that? Um, and trying to bring a sense of fun to the reading experience. And at the same time, I always find byways. I mean, the footnotes go off on paths that I didn't even know existed until I sort of got into it and may explore things that are tangential to the text, but I hope elicit in the reader an expression of, that's pretty cool, or that's really interesting. Now, do you, do you learn a lot about the story? Uh, how do I put this? Is there, is there parts of the story that you were totally unaware of when you actually end up doing your work? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and for various reasons. One reason is that, of course, I, I always try to look and see. I mean, I, I, maybe you call it laziness. Uh, you know, I want to see what other people have said. So I read a great deal on these topics, on whatever book it is. And and uh, my uh, my most recent books, with the exception of Sandman and Watchmen, they are they are labeled the new annotated, and that's because there are old annotateds out there. So I, I read that stuff and um, want to see what questions previous scholars, previous annotators have examined. But also, part of the process of annotating is reading the text very slowly. One of the things I've sort of built into the process is that my wife and I, uh, my wife Sharon, who's very supportive of this stuff, and started the monster, created the monster in the first place, uh, <laughs> she and I will proofread the original text. And that requires um, a sort of speed of reading that makes you thoughtful. So when you slow down and you're not so focused on, you know, what's going to happen next in the story, you start to notice language, phrases, place names, people's names, etc., that you might have sort of sped by before. And so those things will spark questions. It'll be, what's that? And then I have to go do some research and figure it out. And if it's interesting, it'll end up as a footnote. That, that's pretty pretty interesting. Uh, how much further research do you do on these um, to find out what might be real and what isn't? Well, a lot. Um, I, I mean, the, the quote real parts of these stories really interests me. One of the things that I always have said about uh, the kind of annotating I do is that I've picked books that are so well done that they are really excellent mirrors of their times. So there is a great deal of real stuff. And I, I always joke that someday somebody is going to do the annotated Jacqueline Suzanne in which there'll be a footnote explaining to a contemporary reader, what does it mean that the character looked at her watch? You know, <laughs> what's that? A watch? Yeah. Uh, and and that sort of thing. So, um, no, I, I, I think that uh, there's a great deal of research. One of the things that 
I mean, when I talk about Sherlock Holmes, I, I always say, look, my book stood on the shoulder of William Baring Gould, and I had three great advantages that he didn't have. Number one, I have a computer, and that means that I can use the Internet, I can use word processors and all that. Number two, um, I have the benefit of a massive bibliography that other scholars created. There are 25,000 items listed in a bibliography, many of them relevant to the study. And number three, I got to start with Baron Gould. You know, he started with a blank page. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of research. One of the great joys has been to discover how much incredible historical material is available on the Internet, primary source material. Uh, newspapers, almanacs, magazines, um, and uh, and of course scholarly works going back 150, 200 years in some cases. I, for example, when I was doing Frankenstein, I, I told my wife when I started it, you know, great news, we're going to go to England and we're going to spend a week or so in uh, Oxford looking at the original manuscript of Frankenstein, because it's at the Bodleian Library in, at Oxford. And then, son of a gun, they digitized it. <laughs> so I didn't even have to leave my office. I just could sit here and look at the manuscript on my own computer. It was really <laughs> maddening. I, had <laughs> kill, I killed that trip. But, um, no, I mean, the resources on the Internet now are staggering. In addition, there's some surprising resources. I mean, one of the, I always tell a story about... Um, I was looking for some bit of information and found it on the Internet, and it was in a book that was sitting three feet from me on my bookshelf. Uh, and I, that book didn't have an index, and I didn't know that that bit of information was in there. But Google turned it up. <laughs> yeah. But I have strange <laughs> resources. I mean, I have an 1888 Britannica. I have a 1910 Britannica. I have a lot of almanacs and gazetteers and travel guides and the like, and I love using them. They're just great tools. So the latest book that I'm doing um, the, the, it is a little more contemporary. It's called uh, Classic American Mysteries of the 1920s. Um, but even the 1920s, the 1920s is almost, almost 100 years ago. Oh, yeah. So, you know, having to research the cultural history of, in this case, New York, San Francisco, Honolulu, Chicago, of those periods. You know, I'm out sort of running around trying to find city directories and uh, travel guides and the like to find out things like, for example, uh, one of the books, in the, there's five novels in that book. Um, the five novels are the first Charlie Chan mystery called The House Without a Key, um, the first Ellery Queen mystery called the Roman Hat Mystery, uh, the first Dashiell Hammett called Red Harvest, um, the first gangster novel called Little Caesar, and uh, the first Philo Vance detective novel. Philo Vance was a very, very popular detective of the day yeah. uh, by S.S. Van Dyne. That one is uh, the Benson murder case. So Van Dyne is in New York, Ellery Queen is in New York, Charlie Chan is in Honolulu in San Francisco, uh, Red Harvest takes place in a slightly fictionalized Butte, Montana. Um, so lots of geographical research. Uh, and, I mean, things like Ellery Queen, the Roman hat mystery, takes place in the theater. So I'm looking at theater seating diagrams from the 1920s, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> just strange things. Well, I would imagine there's so much to encompass here. Uh, how do you feel about things? Um, we come across um, shows and people that have claims and write books on mm -hmm. um, solving crimes and, and things such as, uh, you know, Jack the Ripper and and, and, and numerous of them. You know, there's tons. Right. And, well, and, I mean, I, I, I read some true crime. Right. And um, it's it's interesting stuff. And, I mean, there's certainly some important books. I, I would, this is a good time for me to plug a book that I did last year uh, with Laura Caldwell called Anatomy of Innocence, Testimonies of the Wrongfully Convicted. Now, that was a, a, a sort of true crime anthology in which we put together the stories of 15 
people who had been exonerated um, for crimes that they of which they were completely innocent, but meanwhile had spent years and years in prison. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, I think from a social justice standpoint, it's important to, to look at those kinds of uh, studies, those kinds of books, and, and those are important. But you know, I'm I'm a, I'm, I'm more of a regular mystery reader um, mm. as opposed to true crime. Uh, well, I was just wondering if 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 something comes up, like uh, sometimes history will put on a show uh, uh, from some book, and it'll be uh, you know my whatever my great grandfather was jack the ripper or right something right and and they come up with this theory it's usually always based on one or two concepts and one of them would be for instance oh the the writing of the one of the letters of jack the ripper used these two phrases and they were not english phrases they were american phrases right you know, things like that but how do, how do you look at stuff like that? Because you, you study this as in to annotate, right. to so I, do it. Yeah, I mean, I, you're right. I, I look at a lot of text. Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, I think that that's valid stuff. I mean, the Sherlockian um, approach uh, is, uh, is sound. It's just hard to do because there's so much data and trying to find the relevant data. But no, I mean, I understand that sort of looking at something. Again, I do the same with texts. I'm looking through the texts for clues. Right. Um, but, to, but, but it has to be more complete, is what I'm saying. Like, if I was to sure. go out and say, this person killed this person because he used this phrase and it was written in here. But right. don't, we, don't we need to have a little bit more uh, complete kind of thought of what else was going on in in the world in that city um like there's just so much missing sure. to, to pick that no no I, you're absolutely right you're absolutely right i mean you can't fa facts never exist in a vacuum they exist in a social and historical context and um and that's exactly what i'm trying to bring out i mean you you may read Take a Sherlock Holmes story, for example, in which the character uh, is a typewritist. Uh, the, the one, of the, one of the sort of lesser known and, and lesser regarded stories called A Case of Identity about a woman named Mary Sutherland who seems to be sort of foolish. Um, she's been duped by her stepfather into thinking that he's a, he's a new lover, etc. But I find the story fascinating because of her social position. She was a, uh, a young woman. She had a small inheritance, so she had a slight amount of income from there, but she was a typewritist, which was one of the handful, tiny handful of occupations available to women of that era, the era being roughly 1890. Um, they could be, they could be uh, nannies um, or they could be typewritists. And typewriting was a great thing. They would own a typewriter. They would type documents in their home for clients. And they could make, according to Mary Sutherland, she says she makes a hundred pounds a year. Well, that's a pretty small amount of income, but it was enough for her to live. That's like five hundred dollars U.S. at the time. Um, so, I think there's a lot to be appreciated, gathered from these small clues about the social milieu and what life was really like, and can it be used in a situation of crime solving of course so now i i noticed also that uh, one of your last books there uh, w just in november was called <laughs> echoes of sherlock holmes yes so what, those are a little different so. yeah i was going to say they're a little different so what what is kind of what's going on with that book okay well so i've done two different kinds of anthologies um in addition to these annotated books and um one of them is a is a series that my friend Laurie King and I uh, came up with, and and we have a fourth volume. Glad you asked. We have a fourth one coming out in December, um, and the idea was this: um, once upon a time, we were at a mystery convention together, and L Laurie is the author. I don't know if you've had her on the show. Laurie is the author of the Mary Russell series, a very very successful series of mystery novels involving a young woman who at the age of 15 meets 
the retired Sherlock Holmes. He's uh, in his 50s. Uh, he takes her under his wing, he trains her, and um, eventually he marries her, but uh, at a decent age, when she turns 21. Uh, and the books are really about her, but Holmes is an important character. So Laurie and I always end up doing um, Sherlock Holmes-related panels at the mystery conventions. Well, this particular year, the organizers said, who would you like on your panel? And I said... Michael Connolly, Lee Child, and Jan Burke, who I knew were at the convention. And they said, well, those are our guests of honor. We don't do that. And I said, well, no, this is going to be an unusual panel. Um, I happen to know that they are all secretly fans of Sherlock Holmes. Um, and let's do a Sherlock Holmes panel, and it'll be great. And we did the panel, and, of course, those guys sat there on the panel, and they said, well, they would say, well, I don't really know very much about Sherlock Holmes, but, and then they would come up with these <laughs> wonderful, insightful remarks about whatever the question was about Sherlock Holmes and, and, and mysteries and all that. So after the panel, uh, I said to Lori, I wonder if those people would write something for us if we put together an anthology. People who are sort of not known as Sherlockians. So we started going to our friends in the mystery world, every one of them an A-list writer, and said to them, I know that you love Sherlock Holmes. Would you write us a story inspired by Sherlock Holmes? We're not asking you to write a Sherlock Holmes story. We're asking you to write a story that comes out of your experience of having read the Sherlock Holmes story. So some of the stories in these, and there's three anthology so far. The first one is called A Study in Sherlock. The second is called In the Company of Sherlock Holmes. And that one won the Anthony and, and uh, Silver Falchion for best anthology. Um, and the stories are by people like Lee Child, Jeff Deaver, Michael Connolly, Sarah Paretsky, etc. Major names in the mystery world. Many of them American, not all. Some we have uh, we have Denise Mina from Scotland. Uh, we have uh, my my friend uh, Michael uh, uh, Stewart from uh, from Ireland, uh, and so on. And some of them are not even mystery writers. I mean, we went to people uh, who were known for writing. In uh, Neil Gaiman wrote a story for us, for example. Uh, and uh, in, in this next collection, we have uh, Weston Oakes, a well-known horror writer. Cornelia Funke wrote a story for us in one of the collections. Uh, they all come from their love of Sherlock Holmes. And some of them are stories about detectives that when you read them, you say, wow, it's Holmes and Watson. Some of them are stories about minor characters in some of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Some of them are about fans of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and so on. And they're just delightful. It's been so much fun to do this series. So we have four anthologies like that. The fourth one is called For the Sake of the Game, and it comes out in December from Pegasus Books. You know, um, I, I, I just wonder, you've got a lot of Sherlock Holmes, and, all, and then I see Dracula as well. Is there certain things that, that lead you to certain books? Well, like I'm a geek. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'm, a, I'm a geek at heart. Well, and, then, and not just Dracula. I mean, H.P. Lovecraft, um, Frankenstein certainly not a mystery, uh, and uh, and Watchmen and Sandman, um, both of you know those are those are graphic novels which have nothing to do. Well, I always say Watchmen is a murder mystery, but um, yeah, I mean I am interested in books that have passionate audiences. Dracula is one of them. Frankenstein is one of them. Lovecraft is one of them. Uh, because the passionate audiences, first of all, they respond to my appreciation of those books, um, and it is nice to sell books. I mean, it's you know, I don't, I, I it's certainly I, I've I've pitched the idea of annotating books that I Norton and others have said nobody's going to buy that book less. Yes, we agree, it's an interesting book, but there's no audience for it. Uh, so I try and pick books where there's going to be an audience. People are going to actually read it and appreciate careful attention to one of their favorite books. 
Uh, and I'm a geek myself. As I said, I started out in the science fiction field. I love graphic novels. Um, and so, yeah, my tastes are certainly much broader than the mystery world. But, I, but I'm really happy to be going back to the mysteries now with this 1920s collection. And my hope is that it'll do well enough that uh, we'll do the 1930s and the 40s and the 50s and so on. Oh, I bet it will. I'd be surprised if it didn't. There's so much, you know, the true crime and the whole, uh, that whole genre is just so popular now um, in so many ways that uh, yeah. I, I think it fits. I think it's a great time, too. It's a great time. I mean, it's, it's so interesting to do this stuff. When I was doing Watchmen, for example, um, did you know Watchmen? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, so it's it's set in. I mean, it's an alternate universe. Uh, it's set in 1986, and in this alternate universe, um, don't don't be too frightened by what I'm going to say. Richard Nixon is still in office. Uh, <laughs> he's in his fourth term as president. He's gotten the Constitution amended. Uh, and uh, we're on the brink of nuclear war um, with the Soviet Union. At the same time, it turns out there's an actual superhero in the world, Captain um, uh, uh, Dr. Metropolis, who is uh, uh, the byproduct of an atomic accident. And Moore says that what he wanted to uh, explore was how the world would have been different, would have changed, um, if, in fact, there was a real superhero in the world, uh, and in this case, an American superhero. Uh, so, for example, we win the Vietnam War handily uh, because Dr. Metropolis helps the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, but what I was going to point out is then writing this book, um, I had to go back and lay out for the contemporary reader the history of the Vietnam War, the history of Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford and uh, the Soviet Union, because these are already lost. It mm -hmm. was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it was more than 30 years ago that we were in Vietnam. And I, I know that a lot of readers just don't remember that stuff anymore um, or have suppressed it. Oh, or never that's learned. true. No, they, it's just, it's too far gone. Um, yeah. We have a lot of listeners that are 30, 35. Uh, exactly. They, it's not the same just being told about it, you know, it's just, and not living it. It's just... That's right. That's right. So it's really, I mean, it's, you know, the idea now that uh, it's, so we laugh about this, we writers laugh about this, that the category of, quote, historical mystery uh, now, now encompasses books that cover periods prior to 1950. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's got it's got your life in it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But um, but it's been fascinating to study those time periods because you look at them in a different way than when you were living through them. Well, yeah, um, you're, look at, you're looking back, and now you have lived longer, you've learned more, and you look right, back at it differently. Plus, plus, there's not the same tension. Like when you're there, exactly. and it's happening, right? So well, and also there's presumably some objective um, histories that have been written about those periods too, so that it isn't just trying to read the newspapers and yeah. you know. How, well, how do you how, and, and, and then how do you deal with something like that? Because in in the in the Trump world now, and uh, where you know, Infowars is the uh, big uh, national news agency, how is it that what we're told is true? Like, you know what I'm saying. I know There's just so yeah. much anti, um, it's just all liberal or whatever. There's some sort of bad word associated right. well, with... Well, it's just biased. It's it, just biased. I mean, it's just, you know, it may be biased toward the point of view that you agree with, or it may be biased away from the point of view you agree with, but a lot of the stuff that's on the Internet, which is our news, is biased. It's very hard to find objective reporting. Well, um, well but it changes the story to the fact of, okay, so we, we've learned some of the basics about the Second World War and, the, and right. dropping the bomb and all this stuff, and then you get it, and now there's a whole 
narrative and there's books out that uh, the president knew they were going to uh, that uh, Hawaii was going to get bombed and you've got you've got all these you know very complex um, histories written now by groups that have a substantial following and yes. a belief in society like a, you know it's a pretty decent percentage and 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 I just don't that sort of terrifies me a little bit. I mean, sure, there's well, always bias. The U.S. is going to write about, well, we won the war, and they, it's going to be that side. Right, and you still, you still have to sort it out. I mean, right. and, and when you go back, by the way, if you go back, for, let me give you a for instance. Um, the first Sherlock Holmes novel you may know is called A Study in Scarlet, and um, it's in large part about the Mormons. Now, the Mormons were a subject of intense interest in Victorian London um, in the late 19th century. And there was a great deal of coverage of things in the press. And there was a, <laughs> there was a number of books about, oh, those evil white slavers and all that. I mean, my point being, they were absorbing contemporarily the same kind of distorted investigative reporting slash journalism that we do today about things, about that subject. And when you go back and you try and sort through now from the perspective of 100 years later what was really going on, there is still controversy because the church has been secretive about things. Um, but at least we get a little more balance. We can see a little more objectively, yes, there were bad things. Yes, there were good things. Um, I just finished reading, and if you haven't read it, I really recommend reading Mark Twain's autobiography. It's it's enormous, you know, it's like three thousand pages long. But um, the reason it's relevant to this conversation is because he put down a stricture that it couldn't be published for a hundred years, and he said he did that because he wanted to be able to tell the truth. He wanted to be able to express his views about people and historical events with no danger that he was going to hurt feelings, you know, get sued for libel, those kinds of things. So, for example, he hated Teddy Roosevelt and goes on and on and on about Roosevelt. And it's interesting to read that now without the heat of the day, you know, when we can look back and sort out the evidence and say, was he right, was he wrong, uh, with maybe some more objectivity. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, it comes out of this literature, too. It certainly comes out of this literature. So it's a great deal. I love annotating because I just learn so many things all the time. Yeah, I guess it, it, it's, it, well, it's like anything. It's constant change, and, and it's just kind of, uh, I just find it amazing. And uh, I think... Uh, it, I, I just don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> well, I hope forward. Yeah, we'll I hope so too. You know, we've got a. And then, you know, and then this is. I mean, one of the things that I take great joy out of too is that this is. I'm writing about books. I love books, and um, you know, I, it's it's my joy to write about books and to maybe get other people excited about books. Well, it, it, uh, you know, and especially in the world today where so many people can have easier access to publishing their own book and uh, right. and getting it out there. And uh, I, I, I think it opens it up to more, just to more people. You know, everybody can, can get into it. Mm -hmm. So what kind of things have you got planned next? Like where where are you heading now? Well, I want to. I guess I, I'm, I'm. I'm about to sign a deal. I, I. I can't tell you the title because we haven't actually signed a deal yet. But I'm about to undertake annotating a major fantasy novel. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's one that I love, and it, I've wanted to do it for a long time. Um, so that's in the works. There are um, a second volume of my annotated H.P. Lovecraft comes out uh, next year. Um, we were, for reasons of sort of trying to keep the book affordable, um, we only put 22 stories in the first volume, and it still turned out to be 900 pages. 
there's another 25 stories that are going to be in a second volume that comes out from Norton, uh, I think, October of next year. Um, and as I said, this uh, classic American uh, uh, crime writing, that comes out in October of this year. So that's what's coming down the pike. Boy, you're just not stopping, are you? <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, it's. Uh, I, I figure I've only got another twenty, thirty years. So, oh God! So I got to. Well, so I got to get busy. <laughs> geez, I tell myself I've got ten, and. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm being I'm being uh, facetious. I <laughs> wish I have another twenty, thirty years. We'll see. Uh, so, but uh, no, I, I'm sorry. I waited until I got to this stage of my life to start. Yeah. I wish I'd started writing twenty years earlier, but. Now I just I love doing it, and uh, and the reception of the readers has been so positive that I just want to keep going. Yeah, yeah, I can relate to that myself. So, who are your favorite writers today? Contemporary yeah. writers? Yeah. Well, so I'm a, I do love mysteries. Um, I read uh, I read Bob Crace's books. I read Michael Connelly's books. Um, that's probably my main two mystery writers. And then I read, I still read a great deal of science fiction and fantasy. I just finished the first volume of the new Philip Pullman trilogy uh, called The Book of Dust, which I loved. Um, what else am I reading? Uh, I mean, I read all kinds of things. I'm reading A Legacy of Spies by John Le Carre. Uh, I will, you know, my dear friend Neil Gaiman, I love everything he writes. Um, so I read pretty eclectically. I, I always look at, you know, who won the Neg Nebula or Hugo Awards in the science fiction field, try and read those books. Um, so I read fantasy, science fiction, and mysteries. And then once in a while, for recreation, I might read some mainstream literature. I loved A Gentleman in Moscow. I thought that was a great book. Yeah. Um, and But I, I try not to, I mean, I do so much reading for research that I don't really take the time to read um biography you know current history books and things like that right shame right. on me but shame. i just you know there's there's a limit <laughs> and i must say by the way i i have a, almost an hour can drive each way to and from the office so probably 90 percent of my reading now is audio and oh. i love that yeah. i love audio i i do too actually i i hate to admit it but uh it's true i i, I do so many audio books i'm it's just crazy. All at night, I, I listen to them with my dog, and then and <laughs> and driving Great. and doing everything. Great. I just love it. Well, you know that the, the eyes are going. You know. Uh, well, that's yeah. I understand. You know, so, uh, it's it's it's, a, it's straining to uh, read. I had both cataract exactly. surgery and. Uh, oh well, that's too bad. You know, it's um, yeah. but now they've got audio. Audio's great. <laughs> yep, it's great. So. And that's fantastic. Well, I'll tell you. All right. It's certainly been interesting. I, I just love yeah. uh, history and this sort of information, and uh, I think that uh, we'll hear, but I'm sure the listeners, is just, they're just going to love this. So uh, well, thank great. you for, well, for, for taking the time. And uh, uh, It's my pleasure. My pleasure. I love talking about these books, and, uh, and great to be on your show. Harvey. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.